Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Bernadette Dalmots and in this presentation, Anna Detchen and I will introduce Nurturing Care for Early Childhood Development. We will first discuss the science that confirms the concept of nurturing care. We will then present the nurturing care framework and reflect upon its implementation. The evidence for nurturing care was presented in the Lancet series Advancing Early Childhood Development from Science to Scale that was released in 2016. Here are five key messages highlighted in this series. First, the foundation for lifelong health, productivity and well-being is being built in the early years, starting from pregnancy. Second, at least 250 million children under five years of age, or 43%, are at risk of not achieving their developmental potential. Third, nurturing care is what young children need to develop physically, mentally, and socially. Fourth, investing in early childhood development reduces inequities. And last, the health sector has an important role to play in advancing this agenda. The early years are very important for children's holistic development. Early on in pregnancy, nerve cells are formed at an astounding speed. And in the third trimester, these cells start connecting through a process called synapse formation. This wiring of the brain underlies our ability to sense, learn, remember and develop feelings and behaviors. It is dependent on a supportive environment that provides nutrition, stimulation and protection. Once the baby is born, the brain is like a sponge. It senses everything and craves stimulation and experience. In a supportive and secure environment, synapse formation is strengthened and learning is enhanced. But if the brain fails to receive appropriate experiences, then the formation of these connections will be impaired and brain structure and function will be damaged. This is why nurturing care in the early years is so important. Early child development is a result of the interaction between nature and nurture. We all have our genetic blueprint that is embedded within our DNA. And because of very small differences in this DNA, we are all different people. Environments can accentuate these differences by chemically marking and changing the expression of the DNA, a process called epigenetics. This can be for the better or the worse. When the environment is nurturing, it promotes health and well-being. But when children are undernourished or poorly stimulated, the environment impedes a child's optimal development. In fact, we now know that the parent's health and well-being even before the pregnancy, the pregnancy environment and the environment in infancy and childhood are very important for early childhood development. Quite simply, the quality and timing of these early environments shape a child's future potential. Therefore, we need to take on a life course approach to support early childhood development. Healthy parents are more likely to have healthy babies and supportive nurturing environment in the early years lead to many positive outcomes across the life course for health, nutrition, learning, productivity, and social cohesion. The Nurturing Care Framework provides us with a roadmap for action. It summarizes why efforts must begin in the earliest year from pregnancy to age three, how nurturing care protects children from the worst effects of adversity, and what caregivers need in order to provide nurturing care. 
The framework hinges on two interrelated action areas. The first are the components of nurturing care, good health, adequate nutrition, responsive caregiving, security and safety, and opportunities for early learning. All five components are equally important and the child's brain and body expects and needs them for healthy growth and development. The second action area pertains to enabling environments. It recognizes the critical role that parents and other caregivers have in providing nurturing care and articulates the importance of communities, services and policies to support families of young children. There are many existing interventions in health and nutrition that are essential for nurturing care. They need to be implemented with high quality and coverage. There's also need to invest in security and safety. This means implementing interventions such as safe water and hygiene, clean air, safe spaces for recreation and provision of social care or cash transfers for those families who need it. And then there are the interventions for responsive caregiving and early learning. Some are familiar, such as skin to skin contact and kangaroo mother care. Others may need capacity development of care providers, such as to support responsive caregiving, play and communication. We will learn in this workshop about these later. Policies are needed to create enabling environments for families to provide nurturing care. Here are some examples of policies that are essential. They span different sectors, including the health sector, and are all important to provide parents and other caregivers with the time and resources they need to care for young children. I have highlighted the important role that caregivers have in providing nurturing care. In fact, children become attached to loving caregivers and this attachment enables them to learn. When young children are separated from their trusted caregiver, they get distressed and may cry. And when they are scared or unsure, they turn to their loved ones for reassurance. The concept of attachments informs the WHO guideline improving early childhood development. The guideline has four recommendations. It stipulates that all infants and children should receive responsive care and early learning opportunities during the first three years of life and parents and other caregivers should be supported to provide this. The guideline also recommends integration of caregiving and nutrition interventions, and it alerts to the importance of addressing maternal mental health. Thank you, Bernadette. So why this agenda now? Bernadette has shared the science underlying the nurturing care framework. Caregivers and children need support for early childhood development, and with the Sustainable Development Goals, we have committed to ensure children not only survive, but also thrive and have a chance to develop their full potential. We have an opportunity to strengthen nurturing care through the renewed focus on primary health care, which, with its three pillars of integrated health services, multi-sectoral collaboration and coordination, as well as engaged and empowered communities, provides a key platform for the strengthening and implementation of nurturing care. Interventions that support all five components of nurturing care should be part of a comprehensive package of services accessible for all families and children. All children and families need some support, but some need all support they can get. Therefore, the intensity and range of interventions varies as illustrated here across the three levels of support. Basic universal support, including information, affirmation and encouragement, and primary prevention should be provided to all children and caregivers at the primary health care, including community level. 
Providers at this level of care need to be able to identify those families that might require additional support and able to facilitate necess necessary referrals. Targeted support, the middle layer of this graphic, should be provided to those families or communities that have increased risk for poor outcomes caused by factors such as conflict, HIV, adolescent pregnancy, poverty, undernutrition, and many more. These families require universal but also additional contact with trained providers and facilities, their communities, or at home. They may also require extra resources such as financial benefits. The top layer, indicated support, is reserved for those families or children that have additional needs and individualized needs-based services. These may be young children without caregivers, violent homes, or depressed mothers children with developmental difficulties or disabilities. Families' needs for support have increased across the world as part of the COVID-19 pandemic, highlighting the importance of systems equipped to ensure these families are not left behind. COVID led to increased levels of stress, food insecurity, reduced access to early childhood education and social interactions, and reduction in care seeking for health and other social services. It is important to know that the nurturing care agenda is part of and has helped to inform a broader effort to facilitate strategic shifts that advance child and adolescent health and well-being, led by WHO and UNICEF. Building on the five domains of the nurturing care framework, but applied to children and adolescents up to 19 years of age, this agenda outlines strategic shifts and actions, including a comprehensive life course approach for programming and multisectoral linkages and informs guidelines and programmatic guidance moving forward. All efforts currently undertaken in countries to strengthen nurturing care are crucial components to realizing this broader agenda and contribute important learnings. The nurturing care framework suggests five strategic actions to support its operationalization. For each of these, governments need to lead and coordinate important activities. The first action, Lead and Invest, relies on a joined up government-led strategy, closely coordinated among different sectors and levels of government to align policies, planning and financing. Creating such coordination mechanism is important to get started. Families and communities are key to realizing nurturing care and create a positive enabling environment for accountability. A strong communication strategy and participatory approaches will increase community engagement. Both coverage and quality of services are required to ensure all families and children receive nurturing care, emphasizing the need for system strengthening and ensuring a well-trained and capacitated workforce. Existing services need to be strengthened and opportunities created to add additional services and interventions without impacting quality. Measurement and accountability are essential for effectively implementing policies, but monitoring has to happen at different levels at the individual level to monitor the development of individual children, at the program as well as the population level. Partnerships with researchers and scientists help to develop local evidence and inform local solutions. You can find out more about how to advance along each of these actions in the Nurturing Care Handbook, which you can find in your resource list as well as on the Nurturing Care website. Last, Operationalizing nurturing care does not mean starting from scratch, but rather, rather building on what already exists. And then remember, strengthen and add. It starts with identifying, remembering and comprehensively mapping what is already done across relevant sectors and levels. Where are opportunities to strengthen either the coverage or quality of services or collaboration and coordination across sectors? And last, where do we need to add actions and interventions to assure, ensure all components of nurturing care are addressed and all families and children reached? We hope this overview was a useful introduction. In subsequent presentations, we will dive, dive deeper into the different strategic actions of the nurturing care framework. There are a number of additional materials that have been developed to support advocacy for and implementation of the Nurturing Care Framework. You can find numerous resources on the website, nurturingcare.org, as well as the Early Childhood Action Network, ECDAN. You can also check out the resource list that was shared with, your, with you prior to the meeting. Thank you very much.